Hey, how's it going, Kartik? Thank you for, for joining. Yeah, thanks for, you know, uh, sending the email that made me aware of this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was, um, I found you on LinkedIn. Um, I, I had basically put together a search on LinkedIn looking for, uh, looking for entrepreneurs, early stage entrepreneurs, uh, owners and founders, companies, um, specifically looking for people who are currently in the mix, you know, not, not necessarily those people who had already built, you know, tremendous, huge companies that if I were to interview them may only, uh, may only give me like, when you ask for like business advice, they kind of give you this weird kind of arbitrary advice. Like, well, when I went to Everest and <laughs> I learned about dedication and commitment and all that, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, yeah. I wanted to have real conversations with real people who have, you know, set something up, who have started, who are, you know, in the middle of like their, their revenue generating, their profit generating, but they're, they're actually going through, um, the trials and tribulations of a typical entrepreneur in business. And so I was going around looking at lots of different companies on LinkedIn and I found yours. And it's interesting because you have like a learning, like a seven square learning, right? Yeah. And so once upon a time I used to work in well, in London with a company called Best Training, and they used to do a similar thing, providing online education. Um, and they would, you know, it was like kind of like further education for after school. And then it had like, a, they had like elements of like um, mm -hmm. corporate training in there as well. And they actually had recruited me to assist with them with their sales, uh, their sales flow. And so I have like a little bit of an understanding of that world. You know, I've, I do some training things for my, but, but, you know, for myself as like an entrepreneur, sort of like entrepreneurial teacher. Uh, but nothing like what you do. We're not nothing that's highly structured or or following a, a syllabus or curriculum. Um, so I did want to have a conversation with you just because I had some insight into that world. Well, first of all, thank you for sharing all that with me. I think that's great. Um, I think you're covering the raw stories. Um, I mean, just look at this call, right? Uh, we just started immediately. Like there's no script. There's no um, there's no preparation. You know, we're just talking for the first time ever. And yeah. this is also raw. And I think... The fact that you're capturing that is what's intriguing me. Um, and I love the idea. Um, That's brilliant. And yeah. second, um, so, you know, you mentioned that um, you, you talked about systems, you talked about, you know, having structures that we have built uh, on 7 Square Learning uh, or at Valo. Um, uh, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, it's all chaos, man. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> <laughs> Like, you, know? you, get it, you get it done yeah <laughs> company says i need i looked at your syllabus i looked at your website here i'm like okay so sat act um i was like okay so what's an act crash course i'm like is this is this company have like do you get like a corporate client and they say we need this so you quickly go ahead and find the syllabus curriculum, find the tutors on it, and then whip something together. I know that's how it worked with Best Training, the company I used to work with back in the UK. Uh, no, I actually didn't. Um, I was actually just all planned out. I was thinking that, look, um, I don't want to miss out on the people that uh, want a quick solution. Uh, because, you know, like a lot of parents that are looking for quick fixes. Like, you know, yep. they just want like a 50 point, 100 point improvement within one month or, you know, half a month. And uh, to be honest, um, it is not very um, ethical uh, to give wrong hopes to someone just because they're desperate. Yeah. And also, uh, you know, a lot of companies are built on that idea that, uh, you know, if we uh, just offer them something at this point, we can, you know, make some cash out of it. Uh, I feel like what I was thinking uh, when I added this option was that I want to provide parents with an alternative that is a lot better, but a lot more realistic. And is it's a process that will also educate them about, you know, um, how this all works, because I've seen so many families spend a lot of money um, on services uh, that didn't actually end up giving them the results that they wanted. So I wanted to build a system that is very comprehensive, very transparent, open and um, very easy to understand as well. You know, it's a crash course, you know, yeah. uh, we're going to put you through a process. We're going to identify your strengths and weaknesses. But to give you realistic numbers before charging anything that, look, this is how much we think we can get you. If you are not able to get to that number, then what's the plan? You know, we also prepare that for them. And yeah. I feel like that part was being missed by a lot of people. And I felt that, um, you know, I could do this. So that is why I gave that offer.
Yeah, I because I I saw the, I saw the guarantee um, on the homepage. Expert chooses who guarantee score improvement, and that reminded me. Yeah. Uh, it sent my mind back to a campaign that I had structured. And by, when I talk about this campaign, I'm talking about 2010, 2009, yeah. um, when I was working for a comp like that company, Best Training. And, and we said, "Let's. How can we use the word guarantee <laughs> without getting like pinched for it? Because it relies yeah. on the actual student putting in the work ethic, right? Exactly. And yeah. so it's the student putting in the work and their work ethic. And so. What we did was we created like a, back then it, it wasn't like AI, there wasn't anything super fancy, but there was like a Clippy type widget. Do you remember Clippy from Word Word documents? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had like that. We said, "Pass." This is your pass guarantee, like copilot, and you know you will you will you will pass guarantee, uh, or you will get like this improvement guarantee um, if you follow these steps. And if you don't follow these steps, it's gonna we'll we'll give you a hundred percent of your money back. Yeah. Um. And so what it what but we obviously we made it like real like they had to really study for it. So, yeah. um, what it would do it was it would track how many uh, courses they would take within the platform. So, you have to do, uh, ten ten uh mock tests, uh you know practice tests uh within the fourth week, four weeks out of your main test day. And then within your, in the third weeks out, you got to do another, you know, eight. And then in the, in the second week out, I forget what it was, but like, and then it would get, it, it would start increasing the numbers. Like they said, they'd have to do like an exorbitant amount of mock tests. And we kind of figured that if they did yeah. that many practice, excuse me, practice tests <laughs> close to the, the actual exam date, like yeah. well, like weeks out, weeks and weeks out of it. So like the six week mark, the, the five, four, three, two, yeah. we would just hammer in the information um and if they then really didn't do it then okay we could probably just yeah. give their money back but that will increase the probability of successful outcomes and that was really what we were going for is what's our outcome percentage um yeah. and so by doing that it did work and i remember that's how we utilized the word guarantee uh yeah. back then um and there were some other elements too but yeah that's just i just i just you know it, it, it took me down memory lane when i picked up when i opened up your your website <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm glad uh, that you told me about this because I I feel like it's one you know it's 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 that gray area where you can very easily cause a controversy. You know, yeah. uh, even though people might not really listen or understand your point, and they might just start judging you just by looking at a certain word. Mm -hmm. Um. So I I feel like it is definitely you know that area where you have to be a bit careful. You know, what kind of messaging are you setting for your customers, for your uh, peers, and everyone else, right? Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, but uh, I feel that uh, a lot of people uh, who are able to get past that stereotype, uh, who are able to get past, uh, you know, a certain um, uh, mindset, uh, they might be able to look at both sides of the coin. You know, uh, I think uh, this hammer method uh, that you just mentioned, you know, it in a way does work for a lot of people just because, you know, otherwise they wouldn't be motivated enough uh, yeah. uh, to to do that much practice. And it's factually proven that, you know, if if you are able like, we conducted a similar study at my previous company um, where, uh, you know, we looked at the uh, data between the number of tests that were attempted uh, versus the increase in score. And there was a clear correlation between, you know, the uh, higher the number of tests that you were attempted, the higher the score improvement is going to be, right? No matter where you're starting out. And uh, that just, you know, it, it's just common sense in, in a way as well, right? Yeah. So um, I feel like that benefit uh, can sometimes be also overlooked uh by a lot of the uh other you know uh ways the word can be uh the, the word guaranteed uh i think can yeah. be interpreted. Yeah. and then like you could do other things I, I don't know how much gamification you in you include in your your site mm -hmm. um but you are you are you familiar with the whole leaderboard badges and scores oh yeah yeah absolutely my uh my <laughs> first start was actually about gamifying um an entire uh, virtual exchange program for students. So oh, I, fantastic. yeah, I'm familiar. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I mean, I feel like when it comes to learning, learning, um, it like gamification does help a lot. Um, you know, back then when I started in 2000, when I was working with that company in 2008, 2009, um, it was just a matter of just constantly peppering people with emails to kind of remind them to come back into the, the learning management platform. Uh, but now, like you have so many different ways. You have apps. You have like achievements unlocked. But you know badges you can earn, yeah. and, um, and and, yep. and you know, and it's really. And actually, I I just read a book called uh, it's actually the actionable gamification. Uh, That's awesome. 
Uh, UK, gonna... UK Chow, the Octalysis framework. Fantastic. And I'm doing that because I, I released a software, a SaaS uh, called DistroList, which is really about helping people connect with their ideal target buyers through the people, places, and things that already have access to them. And so we started off by just providing an influencer database that have, you know, where you can choose influence influences based on who's in their audience. So you can basically search your ideal customer. It will tell you all the influences that have those people in their audience. And then you could also then filter the influences too, to essentially, uh, you know, find those who align with the, with, with the customers that you want. And also like, cherry pick them based on maybe perhaps their audience size as well. So you didn't have to talk to the people who have a million plus followers. You, you, you'd, you'd rather have maybe 10 people promoting for you who had like say five to 10,000 followers. So that's kind of like where the software came into play. And of course, one of the biggest things is how do I make, you know, when people go in here, they, they have to search and select and then they have to make lists. They understand it, but they don't, it's, it's hard work. Like it's work. So it's like, how do I make it fun for them? You know, um so now okay so now it's like you know uh load you know progression bars and like yeah, you're almost there like close like you know 60 percent, 80 percent, and then like like yeah. badges and all sorts of like rewards for having built lists or how many people have you contact you know congratulations this that high five you something like i'm trying to That's figure good. it out yeah <laughs> um, that is that, that's actually really awesome um because you're trying to gamify a very boring and drudging task to a lot of people in a way, yeah. right? Um, and uh, you're finding a way that can make this more efficient uh, and more fun at the same time. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying. I'm trying. So <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all trying, right? Um, yeah. And that's the point of this conversation. That's that's the point of the, the podcast is to, at this point, talk about your journey as an entrepreneur, but you know what would be really, I've, I've been discussing this with my partner uh, in terms of like what we could do to make the podcast even more valuable so that I could boost it by actually just, because what I wanted to do was put money on the on the actual videos. So we have the podcast that's going to be on like in, in, um, Apple and Spotify. It's, it's on there. I have 17 so far, very, very small audience. Um, yeah. I just started the podcast uh, back in October last year. I did 17 uh, episodes um, and then I had, get, had to get back into my core business, which was launching the software. And as, as, you, as you probably, you probably know just from being involved in like in this industry and launching websites, the last like the last le uh, length is like the hardest, just forcing the developers to get things straight and getting it beta ready, MVP ready. And it's just like, it's hard, it's hard work. And so I put, I put the podcast to the side and now that it's launched, like, let me get back into the podcast, but how can I make them more valuable? And so, you know, what I was thinking about was, and I, it's like, how, like if we can turn the podcast into a teaching, uh, like a teaching, like we pick a, a specific topic, we talk about your backstory, we talk about you building this business, the challenges that you're facing as an entrepreneur, what you're doing to pivot and make the company successful, but maybe also pick a like one of the things that matters most to you in business, like, you know, some people say like, for me to be successful in my business, the most important thing for me to do every single day is outreach. That's the most important for my business is, is making contact with people. Uh, or, or some others may say the most important thing I need to do is go over my KPIs. Someone else yeah. might say it's customer service. Someone else might say it's Actually, it's the bookkeeping because the customers come in. We are, you know, we're this. Or some some others might say it's like making sure logistics are like whatever it is for you. Perhaps we would like choose what that is, and then we discuss it. Like you say, okay, here's this is what I think is the most important as far as me in an online learning space yeah. for this business. This is what I found to be the most difficult thing that I have to do every day. If I don't have this right, everything else falls apart. You know, your team management, yeah. your leadership. If this doesn't work, then everything else is going to have a domino effect. It's going to ruin everything. Like yeah. I have to make this yeah. thing correct. Yeah, yeah, no that that makes that makes sense, man. I mean, I, I tried uh, something similar with you know when I was running a podcast, but um, uh, I just didn't have the patience. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's hard it's to pick it back I, up. I'm, I I do want to talk to you about you know how you managed to reach seventeen because uh, that's a that's a strong journey, you know, uh, <laughs> tough journey. So uh, for sure. 
But uh, well, to answer your question, I think that one thing that um, I need to get right, uh, you know, without which everything would be meaningless uh, for me. So right now I'm building Evalo, um, you know, which is actually a uh, tutoring automation platform. Uh, what we have done is we have combined uh, the three verticals of running a private education business. You know, you require operations, uh, you require content. Without content, you wouldn't be able to assign practice tests, worksheets, drills, you know, um, uh, to the students. And um, then you also require good lead generation. And in our industry, you know, leads come primarily from referrals. So for me, marketing strongly correlates with having a strong uh, referral system uh, built in your tutoring business, right? So like we're addressing all of these concerns through a single um, platform. And um, I think one thing that is extremely crucial for us to be successful in this space is customer experience. Mm. I think for me, uh, that word customer experience is something that covers all the important bits of every single other thing that you need to get right, you know, uh, right from the beginning, you know, uh, the first impressions, you know, getting to your website, not seeing any grammatical errors, uh, making sure that the brand is standing out, making sure that you're communicating with the customer in such a way that you're able to get the message out, right? Um, once you have grabbed their attention, uh, making sure that um, they are seamlessly able to onboard whatever you want them to onboard, right? So whether it's a platform that you've built, make the signup process extremely easy. Uh, make the platform really intuitive, right? Make sure that your, your UX designs are, are amazing. Make sure that uh, your site is loading fast, right? Make sure that there are no uh, bugs, um, uh, you know, when they're using the platform. So I think the product needs to be extremely seamless. The UI UX designs, you know, everything needs to be perfect. And um, then after that, you know, um, if they do eventually need some help, you're always there for them, right? Uh, not there for them in terms of technical support only, but you're there for them in terms of, you know, whenever they require help, there's always, you know, a, a way to reach out to you immediately, to a human immediately. And you're building relationships through that, right? You you might, you might be uh, willing to accept some mistakes that you might have made. Maybe there's a bug in the platform, you know, like you're treating the customer um, in a way that, you know, you're empathizing with them. And I think uh, that entire experience that the customer is going to receive uh, is what's going to be a differentiating factor. Eventually, I think uh, onboarding and, you know, making a sale, um, all of these are just snippets of an entire journey. And I think the way the customer is feeling about the entire process as that customer is, you know, walking through that journey, um, I want that experience to be amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we are just trying to hit that. Yeah, I, I like it. I like that. Um, and you know, that got my mind thinking about like the the onboarding process of the customer. And then I also had no as I was just looking at your website, if you notice me looking down, I was just uh, going through your website. And one of the things that just stood out to me, which I hadn't checked before was your affiliate partnership program. And so it says here yeah. that your packages typically cost in the range of like 1500 bucks. And so 10 to 20%. Um, this was learning you're talking about. Pardon me. This is this is for seven square learning. Uh, like, yes. Not yeah. 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 Eva there's an Evalo login here. Uh, um, yeah, that's that's specifically for seven square learning. Uh, they are two different uh, entities. Ah, yeah. My bad. I've been on. I've been looking at the Evalo. Uh, sorry, the seven squared learning page this entire yeah, time. Yes, so the seven square learning is also a startup that I was running. Uh, ah, okay. But Evalo is the startup that I'm building right now. Ah. Uh, Oh, pardon me then. Let me let me have a look at Ivalo. I yeah. like this is where like LinkedIn fails. And when it built <laughs> when I pulled your name and it came up with he's seven square learning. And so that's kind of where I went. Um and I didn't look at, I didn't look at Ivalo. Um it. so let me just open up Ivalo. Um so I'm familiar with what so we're on the same page. Yeah. Ivalo.org, right? Yep. That is correct. Okay, so here we are. Private education is simple, simplified here. Okay, okay. Okay, so you had round one, now it's round two, right? So you're kind of like advanced in this space. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, hoping so. I mean, you know, you know, this website that you're seeing right now, we had to build that within four days um, because of an event that we were attending. So it's crazy, you know, like there are still chunks that we are addressing in the website. I think by the end of next week, uh, we'll have the entire website loaded properly with all the, uh -huh. you know, everything addressed. So, yeah. Yeah, I see this. It's cool. I like it. Okay. Um, I'm going to have to watch the video here. I see you have one. I'm going to watch that once this call's over. Um, okay. 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 All right. Well, this is, see, this is great. I'm glad to see this. 
and you have a 15 bucks a month professional 29 premium okay unlimited tutors okay so it's like you're, you're essentially you've built a marketplace now yeah um that's one way of one way of looking at it. See, uh, we are building an enterprise software for a very niche uh, uh, industry, right? The tutoring industry, and we are trying to do our best job in, uh, you know, in achieving something that no one has done yet for the industry. You know, we are trying to build something that is so comprehensive that you don't have to ever jump out of this one platform uh, for any of your tutoring needs. If if you want to be a tutor today, you should be able to jump to the website, get everything that you need to get started. And uh, you should be able to succeed in your career, right? If you want to create a product for, uh, you know, individual tutors and small businesses so that they are able to scale up rapidly and also smoothly, you know? Um, so that is the idea. Yeah, I see that. I see that. Okay. And you have an affiliate program for this too, to get people in? Um, we are trying to affiliate with certain organizations, you know, that have a certain network of, uh, private educators. Um, but yeah, I mean, we are okay. definitely open. Yeah. I'm just curious. Like, um, wow. All right. What about, um, let's see one tutor, two to 10 tutors. Okay. I see this. Okay. So all these like private training companies could essentially get people on here and they could produce, um, yeah, definitely. I mean, see, I, our ideal customer right now would be a, a tutoring company that is specializing in test prep. Mm -hmm. um, it could be a tutoring company, could be an individual tutor uh, that is, you know, building a business around the test prep industry. That's like the ideal customer for us. Um, uh, beyond that, if you're just uh, a tutoring company that does a lot of other things beyond test prep, you can still be using the platform um, um, and it is designed to serve their needs as well, uh, just as easily. So, um yeah, like any kind of private educator, to be honest, as long as they're providing tutoring services to students, I think they'll find a platform really useful. Okay, cool. I see that. Okay, this is cool. I like this because, you you know, in, in the conversation that we have, I'll literally point out that I'll, 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 I'll explain this blunder. I'll say like, hey, Karthik, when I first met you or found you, I was talking to you about seven, <laughs> you know, um, the older website. What was it now? Seven something? Seven squared learning. Seven squared learning, right? And it's like, yeah. Um, I was talking to you about that and we're like, no, I've actually moved on from there. This is the upgrade. <laughs> and it's like, so that was round one. This is round two, you know, or that was round two. This is round three and third time's a charm, you know? So yeah, it, exactly. You know, this, that could be a part of the conversation too. I think that's be, that'd be awesome. Absolutely. Um, cool. Uh, let me, let me um, give you a very brief background as to who I am. Yeah. Um, so you kind of know who you're dealing with as a person. I like to make sure that this is open and upfront as uh, quickly mm -hmm. as possible. Back in 2010, I started my own business, a company called Core Agent. Have you, by the way, have you Googled me at all? Have you put my name into Google? Or... I did. Yeah, I was going through LinkedIn and I did Google you a little bit. Uh, the first time I think I had, I had booked a call uh, three, four months ago. Uh, that's when I Googled a little bit about you. But then um, I haven't done much research lately. Okay. Well, yeah. here's, here's the deal. Um, cause sometimes people get it, catch it. Some people don't. Um, so there were, look, at one point I got incarcerated. I was incarcerated for three years in the United States. Um, and I'll give you the backstory in terms of how that happened mm -hmm. and what's happened since. So back in 2010, when I started my business, I built a business called core agents. And like I told you, I, my whole business is about finding the people, places and things, um, to sell companies products, right? I'd build distribution networks for businesses. And I would, I would sell things like rubber from China via foreign exchange brokerages who would make, we would be making money on the Forex conversion on like a, you know, 10 million, hundred million dollar deals, um, from CNY to euros so would be making like money on the FX exchange and would also be making money on the distribution network that we'd be putting together. So it would be going directly into buyers and for instance, Turkey, who were, who were essentially the manufacturers of shoe, shoe soles. And so they'd be buying rubber from China and then they would, you know, the Turkish manufacturers would then sell their rubber on to other people that we would create for them. For instance, shoe man, shoe, shoe, uh, like shoe, shoe companies in the U S that would make like boots and sneakers and running shoes and that kind of thing. And so we started off there and grew into like, uh, lots of different, like different areas, went to real estate, 
building hotels in Dubai, south south of France uh, and, and south of Spain and London, boutique hotels in London. And we started doing commercial property in the US as well, uh, multifamily. Uh, and then we moved into office spaces. And so I would essentially build these big networks out for different companies. And my the way I would maintain getting paid was I would have to structure myself. I have to create a strategic partnership with the company uh, so that when I built this network out, no one could circumvent me and go around to the company yeah. and, and cut yeah. me out the deal. So I became like a, a kind of like a permanent middleman fixture. So a strategic partnership is what we called it. But I mean, joint venture partner, there's other words, there's other names to define it. It's, just, it's whatever it is. It's just like, we're contracted. This is our pipeline. Anyone that goes around us and reaches you doesn't matter. They still, they still belong to us and we still get paid on them. And that was kind of how that, that, that worked. And so one of the companies that I had built that had, I so that had partnered with in that capacity and then built a distribution network of other businesses, people, places, and things that would sell their wares uh, decided to steal a whole bunch of money. That's what the guy did. He stole up out of a, like hundred million. We pulled in the guy ran off with like 30 million, just disappeared, dipped. Uh, they found him, uh, like a year later hiding in Morocco, <laughs> uh, thinking that that was the safest place to hide. I don't know why, uh, white man, blue eyes, British hiding in Casablanca. Didn't make sense to me, but anyway, they picked him up and the problem was, is being a middleman does not insulate you. Uh, and that's what happened with me. I ended up getting charged with a conspiracy charge. So they were throwing around 20 plus years, whatever. And they hit me, they destroyed me. I, I Let me just tell you, at my highest point, I was pulling in a million a month net after expenses. So I felt like I was untouchable. I thought I was like, I had, I had reached the top. I'm the, you know, I'm, I'm God in my industry, my sector, you know, I knew how to build distribution networks that could make all this money. And then that was yeah. my Icarus moment where, uh, you know, I did, didn't do enough due diligence where I saw red flags. I had kind of turned a blind eye to them, uh, thinking that I was insulated as a middleman and it, it, I, it, I got hit. And so I lost all my money. I lost three and a half years of my life in the U S prison system. And as a British citizen, as you could tell from my, my, I was living in the U S for eight years. Um, as a British citizen, you know, even with a green card, because my wife's American, my children are American. Um, I, you lose that. Y if you get incarcerated, you, that green card goes out the w window, you're considered an alien. And yeah. so I ended up going and they put you wherever they want to put you at that point. And as an alien, they normally like to put you in a harsh prison. And so I went to a medium high. Um, so it was a horrible prison to be in. It wasn't like I was in a white collar prison where I should have been playing chess with a guy who'd been in for tax evasion. I'm, I'm now dealing with like gang bangers and stuff, um, like real hardened criminals, murderers and that sort of thing. And it was really a horrible experience. But after the three and a half years I came out, I rebuilt myself and guess what I did? I built distribution channels. First company I started working with was a pharmaceutical. Uh, we worked with them on, uh, with their cancer trials in terms of getting people with cancer into these cancer trials. You know, you can't just like put advertisements out. Hey, have you got cancer? Come check out this trial. You can't do that kind of thing. Right. Um, yeah. but we would have to like work with this company to produce distribution networks to bring in people. So I was making money again. I started rising again. Uh, I built the, I was in the process of building the app and I do a lot of talks here in the UK and that's where the, you know, people were saying, well, you should, you should, you know, you should either be a guru or like have a podcast and talk about stuff. I'm like, well, I don't, I, want, I don't want to talk about my backstory. I want to talk about other businesses. That's what's interesting. Um, and so people are like, you know, they tell me to leverage the story because it's a story of like, you know, ups and downs and it's real, you know, in business you can get. Sometimes you don't, you know, when you start a company, it's not as, um, you know, the, the risk is not that you may fail in business and that you'd have to go back to your day job. The risk is you could be, uh, you could, you know, you could have a licensing problem and have a fines to pay. You could have a lot of debt that you could never get out of. You can accumulate that. Um, you can create a problem where you're being inundated with class action civil suits and you could inadvertently find yourself on the wrong side of the law and be in a criminal uh, case if you, if you, if you really mess up like I did, like yeah. starting a, you know, the, the, the majority of the amount of mistakes that can befall an entrepreneur in the pursuit of money, it's actually, it's, it's you're riddled with them. Um, and so, I felt like actually that story is pretty, a pretty good story. And so 
I do like to share that with you, whoever I'm talking about, talking to you, sorry, in the podcast, but I don't bring that up in the podcast. That's just so you and I know, you know who you're talking to. You know that there isn't anything I'm holding back. Got it. That's amazing. Um, that, that, that's, a, that's a great story. Um, yeah, appreciate it. One heck of a story, man. I mean, um, I, I think, yeah, you know, this, this is something that I kind of needed to hear because um you know everyone who hears you know i i come from a background where um no one around me is actually an entrepreneur you know everyone is in the service sector or they're doing some jobs um i had to get myself out of a certain environment to be able to you know continue with with my journey but then you know once i'm back in 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 the, in the atmosphere a lot of people focus on what they might lose um and that is the fear that they have you know the <laughs> That, you know, if I go on this journey, I might lose out on the job or I might lose out on, you know, um, getting a girlfriend or I might lose out on, uh, on Sweet. I don't know, like some family trips, for example. Right. It's the fact that they're focusing on the risks. Their yeah. risk is based on what they're losing. Their mm. risks are not based on what they might gain. Right. The yeah. opportunity cost is never taken into account. And I feel like that's a big difference because I think um, the one thing that entrepreneurs are really good at is identifying opportunity costs. They know that if they miss out on a certain opportunity, how much they're going to lose. And that's the risk that they have to mitigate. That's the risk that they have to play around with, right? Yeah. Uh, it's not a risk of, you know, you know, like, oh, I might lose a job. Yeah, that that is part of the opportunity cost, right? The opportunity for you really is, you know, um, um, all the things that that you might be able to gain and the risks that come with building that much, right? You know, like like all the things that you mentioned, you have to you have so many compliances to take care of. You have a team to manage, right? You have a reputation to build. All of those are are the risks that you're taking, right? Um, those are the elements that that you're uh, working, and, and no one really focuses on that. And, and I'm super glad that you did. Um, and um, I think more people need to uh, you know, need to look at things this way. They do. They really have to, um, especially in the world that we live in today. I mean, in America, it's not so bad. I, well, I say that with a pinch of salt, actually. Um, there's certain areas like if you're like they, it, jobs pay better in the U.S. compared to like Europe, for instance. Yeah. Um, and you might find that hard to believe being in the U.S., but they do. No, <laughs> I <laughs> you see, I was an international student uh, in the U.S., so I had to compare the, you know, yeah. uh, the salaries and us was definitely much higher yeah know? like my wife was a yeah. social worker in new york city uh working for the school the doe and she's making like 100 and like 120 130 grand yeah. salary there and then like uh, this she's, she's in london and i was like oh why don't we try and look for, for a job for you while you're here and she's like and they're like thirty five thousand. and she's like what yeah. the fuck <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, no <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> he, he looks at me like you better get back into business i'm like i, I will i promise i will <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, there, there's a lot of money in the US. Uh, I, you know, this fact blew my mind. I think the entire state of California has uh, more GDP than uh, the entire country of India. Um, yeah. yeah, it's crazy how much money the US has. Um, yeah, it's my what they're willing to pay. Yeah, it's like, yeah, they don't yeah. just hoard I mean, it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's I, I let think it it's, circulate. <laughs> That that is there. I mean, there's also um, I think the the divide uh, that's there between uh, you know the rich and the poor. The the classic argument uh, you know against uh, against uh, capitalism. Um, I think um, yeah. I I think it's like well, you have no... a huge middle class in the U.S. where like that doesn't yeah, exist yeah, in a like... lot of places in Europe, and and then it's a middle class that like can get the credit cards and kind of have the nice things you get the get, get the big tv get on a, get a nice car on payments you know yeah so that's you... the thing right they're, they're able to me move the mean up significantly yeah uh, and by moving that mean up uh, you know um uh, on the curve uh the average person uh, in the us you know uh versus the average person in other countries you know because i i've you know i've been part of country uh, where we do have real challenges, but a lot of people don't want to talk about uh, those challenges, right? Yeah. Um, I feel like when you look at GDP per capita, you know, the US has been able to increase its wealth drastically, but it's not too unfair to say that their entire, uh, uh, you know, population has definitely benefited from the general raise in the standard of living uh, that the US has been able to see 
uh, since industrialization, right? Uh, same with Europe, right? Uh, I mean, you know, colonies and, and there's, of course, you know, the entire history. Uh, once you go past beyond that argument, uh, I think the in the current situation, um, Europe has been able to um, uh, spread the wealth amongst the masses. Um, and that is what needs to be done now in other parts of the world as well. Now, like now that wealth has been accumulated, I think now it's time that it's also going to start spreading amongst the masses. And when and... that happens, it's also like a, 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 it signals a certain life cycle in the um, in in the uh, there's a point in where I, you, do you know what? I read a, I, I, this is where I get become a geek. Like I I read Andy Ware after I watched the the movie The Martian. Yeah. And so I read like he wrote three books and I read them all. And one of the things he said in his books was like he talked about the life cycle of civil civilizations. And so they have these growth spurts and then it gets to the point which you just mentioned where they have they've accumulated so much but then it goes into a state of reintroducing that money back in to the entitled because yeah. people are certain that they, they need to have a certain level of existence and i feel like that's what happened in the uk and europe a lot yeah. and it's about to start happening in the us like where exactly. you've got the cowboys where there's lawlessness then they have regulation and then you have um like growth and then it comes to a point where you hit this maturity and then it, you can't like pe the, the the divide between the rich and the poor you know starts to increase and the middle class starts to you know deplete and so you then have to switch to keep the company in a with, to stop it from decaying the, the, not the company country civilization to re to remove decay you have to create a baseline and that that now you have to have like free healthcare and 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 sort of benefits in the society like pub, more yeah. public transport and all these sorts of things to kind of keep everything on an even keel. Exactly. Uh, but th but the problem is this is where like the, the account like the whole civilization starts to begin its decline from that point on because they can never restart the growth again uh, without yeah. war, without consistent uh, conquering, and without bringing in new people. Without I almost look at America right now, like you know, with a few steps back, thinking, "Is this what's happening?" Um, and like, you look at places like India. I'm Indian, and I'm like, they 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 put people in space. I'm like, <laughs> like my people put people in space. Like this is so good. But like, so India's on this growth thing, and the middle class is slowly growing because there was a massive divide between the rich and the poor, horrendous divide, but now. They're actually putting together these space programs. They're actually building up. And I'm starting to see the beginnings of like this emerging middle class being grown. And I'm like, yeah. holy crap, maybe India's the next place. I should forget England. I gotta go back home. I gotta go back to my roots. Uh, I'm gonna put brush up on my Hindi and Punjabi. It's like this is this needs to <laughs> this needs to happen. Yeah, see, I think I think, you know, um, to put it in very raw terms, I think the optics matter a lot, right? Um India has, you know, people forget that India has been the richest country for the last 5,000 years almost. And it's only in the last 200, 300, 400 years, maybe, that the country started losing its wealth, right? Because of colonization, right? Uh, I think people forget that um, India as a land is super rich. Mm. Um, India has a very, very strong resource in their hands, which is the human resource, right? Mm. Um, and we are living in the information age. I mean, just think about it. Yeah. The best possible combination that can happen is having a large mass, having a large population, and having the tools of communicating certain elements in, you know, in their mind so that they are able to grow using that information, right? Yeah. You have both of these things today. All you need to do is find a system that is able to, you know, um the catch in the have way. A trigger effect. Yeah. Like, you know, uh you you initiate this wave of skill development of, uh, you know, enhancing the living standards uh, of the citizens of the country, you as you know, if I, I feel like if I were a policymaker today, I would be trying the hardest to make sure that that this connection happens, you know, that we are able to build a system that is so smooth that it's able to run using the human capital that we have today in the country, you know, like, everyone says that India is such a large population, it's a burden, I feel like it's a blessing if you can make it, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, and again, like going back to the optics, the fact that uh, people were underestimating India for such a long time that, look, you know, like we don't know where these areas are going to go. They don't even have, a, a, you know, um, a space institute, uh, you know, 70 years ago. They, they weren't yeah. even a, a free country, right? Uh, and uh, and today, there you go. I think India launched 
uh, some of the most successful missions on the moon, you know, with, um, you know, uh, with Chandrayaan. So I feel like, um, yeah, like it's kind of, it's, it's kind of going to work in India's favor if people underestimate India. Uh, but I also feel that India should also be careful about not being too overconfident uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, we lost the uh, 2023 World Cup, um, you know, and uh, uh, just take that to a million times more scale. We we have to be careful with the way we, you know, run the country uh, for the next uh, 15 to 20 years. I think we have an amazing opportunity and uh, we would want to be really, you know, grabbing it with yeah, all hands. It makes, it makes me proud. It makes me proud. Um, and I, it's like, it's really nice to see like positive things happen. They obviously, you know, there, there, there are pitfalls, but as a country compared to like what they, what's happening around the world, everywhere else, it's like, you know, I remember reading this, I, I, I know we're digressing, but this is a great conversation. I just, I like this. Um, it, there was a thing I read in the economist. They were like, Oh, you know, America, Russia's got all these nuclear, nuclear missiles. And North Korea has all these nuclear missiles. Yeah. <laughs> China has all these nuclear missiles. And then it was like the second largest, I think it was the second largest or perhaps number three largest accumulation of nuclear, like ready warheads that are yeah. like combat ready India. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, yeah. they're like, why is no one worried about why the Indians have so many? And apparently there was like a joke. And this is really like about like British bigotry and snobbery and, you know, I think borderline racism where they're like, oh, well, it's the Indians. They're not going to use them. But it's like, it's like, but the, and, and there was a joke about like, well, a lot of the Indian purchased the, where well, India purchased a lot of the missiles uh, yeah. from Russia. And they were say, well, we, we couldn't pass up a deal because we were doing a two for one. <laughs> so, <laughs> Russia made so many of the damn things. <laughs> so we bought them all. And it's like, why do so why do you have them? Because you guys have them. It's like we stockpile them because you stockpile them. And it's like it just makes it's common it's a common sense thing to do for a country. If we have the money to buy them, we should buy them. And I think England India's approach to that conversation, or at least in the article that I read in The Economist, was it was it was funny. It's because it's like one of the, the most capable, potentially dangerous countries on the planet is seen as this like less than uh problem. It's like Indians like not interested in warring, so don't worry about it. <laughs> um, interesting. I it, it it got me. Just it brought that memory up. I remember reading that. Yeah. See, I think again, it, it all depends on how you want to um you said show optics. something and how you want to perceive things, right? Like, uh, I think people who have a certain mindset are gonna read an article and uh you know perceive it in in, in whatever you know uh, perception they already had. I don't think it's gonna change anything. Um, and you know, the people who, um, were able to look at it from a different point of view, I think they're, they're going to have a different opinion. I think at the end of the day, what really matters is that, um, we as a country, we know where our roots are. I think we know that we always have a, uh, policy where we do not, you know, meddle in other people's business. And we also don't, uh, instigate any conflict. You know, uh, I think we are uh, a country that is built on a culture of peace. And, mm -hmm. you know, historically even, you know, like uh, the first ever civilizations, you know, Harappa, Mohenjo-Daro and the entire Indus Valley, you know, the, the fact, this this actually blows my mind, uh, you know, they didn't have a monarchy. They didn't have any, like, they didn't have a, they didn't have a government. Yeah. Like, it was literally just a group of people living together with proper systems. They would have town hall meetings where the entire town would gather and they would talk to each other and they would come up with solutions and they built an entire culture around it. Uh, and that culture, you know, uh, has uh, gone down into the different um, aspects of, you know, different cultures that we have, you know, like, you know, right from the Vedas and the uh, Puranas and, and everything else that, you know, that came out in the culture. Um, I think the um, the overall, uh, what do you say, you know, the, the intrinsic instinct that um, these his, histories, uh, you know, the, the various versions of the histories uh, that the of the country that we have, what they have instilled in us as a group of people is that eventually we just uh, care about progress, we care about peace, and we care about uh, uh, collaboration, right? Yeah. So I think um, for us, you know, I, I feel that um, for us as a country, um, it is really always going to be the policy that we want to be treated as equals, mm -hmm. and we are equals, and we will stay as equals, right? Yeah. Um, I think uh, we never uh, show that 
we are uh, you know uh, bigger than someone but we also are not going to show that we are smaller than someone i think it's that mentality yeah so, it's like we're not like we don't do enough to be like considered to be the biggest bully in the playground but equally we're not we're going to do what's necessary to make sure we're not pushed around and i like yeah. that you know yeah exactly you know yeah. i like that so like we I don't have to I, be the aggressor but don't 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 fuck with us <laughs> yeah, <laughs> equally like, <laughs> it's 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 the basic human tendency right like you right. have to have that mechanism you're you know uh no one can survive without that mechanism every country is gonna it's gonna do that i mean uh this is all just a concept today you know maybe a thousand years from now there will be yeah, no countries changes. uh so <laughs> yeah. Yeah. we're seeing it's, this graces all... right now you never know yeah um all right look i know we've been talking for a minute but i and by the way this is kind of how the podcast is going to feel mm -hmm. this is how we're going to do it you know I don't want it to be structured, structured. I'd said like, we'll talk about the one thing at, you know, at some point where you're really dishing out some educational piece of information. Like, you know, look, this is, this is what I do with my business. This is what I think if I didn't do it would be crippling for the company. So let me show you what I would do if I was you and you were in the same spot as me. One, two, three, four, five. So there's just like this takeaway, but like, aside from that, it's this, it's this is it's how we're talking right now. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, I like this version a lot better because uh, we're letting it flow uh, in, in a... I, I think what really matters a lot, because if if I think if there's an entrepreneur who started, you know, uh, he, listening to this podcast and as they're going through the entire journey of the conversation, I think what really matters is, um, or the really real takeaway for me at least would be throughout this podcast, you know, I would be thinking how I can make this an opportunity to grow my business. That's the one takeaway, right? Um, for you, Savraj, you know, like how can you, you know, get this podcast out there so that millions of people can probably see a reel or, or you know, uh, watch, uh, you know, or listen to the entire podcast. So I think, I think uh, at the end of the day, every word that's coming out of our mouth, uh, every uh, uh, gesture, every action that we're doing has to be uh, disguised in a way that, it, you know, uh, that you're always thinking about uh, the business, but you're also genuine, uh, yeah. you know, in your approach, you cannot, um, you cannot put a picture, um, in front of people and, uh, you know, you, you have to be raw and you also have to be, and, and I think you have to be shameless. Uh, if you have to have the you're shameless raw, but have it on an underlying like mission, you know, like exactly. the, the agenda is like, okay, here's what I'm trying to achieve, but I, I can yeah. only achieve this knowingly that I have to just be my and I hate to use the word authentic self. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sounds so like, ah, yeah. you said that word. Like, <laughs> to be honest, uh, why don't you just use this conversation as a podcast? I know. It's pretty awesome, right? This was actually yeah, like, natural. <laughs> exactly. I, I feel we like could just put one, like, we could just do this. Just throw this one up anyway. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is podcast number one with Kartik Sada. Welcome to exactly, the Digital and... Boss podcast. Because I, I feel like, uh, I feel like it's worthy of podcast. Yeah, it was a good conversation. I mean, <laughs> like it was all like that. It was discussing like what we what we should or could be talking about, and then we end up talking about a bunch of stuff that was interesting anyway. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. <laughs> so why not? Like, why don't we just put this up? 